Sometimes we live life in the middle of a storm, left out in the open, exposed to the elements. No matter where we look, protection seems miles away. Shelter feels out of reach. Lately, these storms have grown stronger, more intense, more difficult to bear. Where do we look when we can't see the way forward? How do we find a safe harbor? In the midst of the ebb and flow, God promises to be our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. In our most desperate moments, we can rest safely behind the rock of our salvation. Protected by the shadow of his wing, Yes, life has its troubles, but our God is a mighty fortress, our stronghold, our refuge. My friend called me from a phone booth in Kentucky which led to at least a couple of good questions, like A, who uses phone booths anymore? And B, what's he doing in Kentucky? He lives in Texas. My friend's phone had died because he left the house in a hurry. Didn't think about the things we would normally think about. And in his despair and in his anguish, just got in his car and went for a drive. But eventually the battery runs out and the gas does too. And so here is this friend of mine on the phone. And he's hysterical. And he's crying. And he's just talking. And I can't understand half the words he's saying because of what he's going through. But I, I'm picking things out, you know, here and there, trying to figure out what's going on. And it's important. You got to know this about my friend. He and a crier. This dude's like 280 pounds and bench presses 350 or more. Like he was a running back for the college team. You didn't mess with him. I didn't. And yet here he is on the phone, just falling to pieces. And the thing to know about my friend, maybe you know people like this, you're like, he was the life of the party. Like, like when he showed up to the party or to a room, a light came on, you know what I mean? He was just magnetic in his personality. Everyone wanted to be around him. He was just, there's just something about him that, that there was just always this joy. It seemed palpable when he was in the room. And, and he had this girlfriend at the time who looked like a Barbie doll, and they both made good grades. They both played sports for the team. Like, they had their acts together. It's the people you're like, I don't like them. <laughs> but, but I do. And they just seemed like they had their act together. And my friend was this eternal optimist, you know what I mean? He would see light in any darkness and, and, and constantly cheering me on. I remember that about all my life. He's just like, come on, Shanks, you can do it, man. You can get this thing done. Just hang in there. He's just always that encourager. But in the midst of this phone call and the tears and the sobbing, the hysterics, Suddenly things kind of got a little darker, because in between the words I couldn't understand, I did hear some, and that was gun in the car loaded. Things got bad. What do you do in that moment? My friend had dated this girl for two to three years. Like I said, they were just the perfects. Everyone wants to be like them. But I, about six months into his marriage, she came home one day and she said, You know what? I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Whatever that means. My friend got in the car and he just drove. And it would take years to put the pieces together on this, to figure out what, what really happened. When she was young, her mom died when she was six years old. Dad 
tried to hold it together, but he found himself in addiction and, and neglect and other things, and the state had to come in and remove her from the home, and she went from foster home to foster home. Over time, there's even some hints of sexual issues in there. We never quite put our finger on it. My friend came from a, a terrible lifestyle, home life. His dad cheated on his mom all the time. He was a, a former Vietnam vet, a hero on one hand, but a, on the other came home with a bad case of PTSD and a lot of anger to deal with as well. As a result, the family fell to pieces and the impending divorce just ripped them apart and they're still, still dealing with it today. The truth is, both my friend and his then wife came into the marriage with all these hurts, these pains, this baggage. And don't you know and find out ultimately in life that whatever hurt, pain, and baggage you're carrying, you bring with you into the marriage. Whatever unresolved issues there are, even if you think they're hidden away, they will come to light in the marriage. Because yes, there's a honeymoon at first and everything's all good during the honeymoon. But eventually that honeymoon wears off and you got to do life together. And all of those unresolved issues that you did not deal with before you got in the marriage, they will find their way in to the relationship. I promise. Neither of them had confronted the issues. And more and more, as my friend and I talked over the years, nor had he put in the proper foundation in his life to weather the storms. He didn't have the strong foundation. He didn't have a good plan to help him go by, and he, nor did he have standards to live by. And when the waves came crashing in, and the floodwaters rose, and the rain came down, his house washed away. His marriage, his relationship had years of junk that hadn't been dealt with. And without a plan to resolve it, the storms of life took him. And the truth is, because we bring all this into the marriage, if it wasn't this, it was going to be something else. But it's what my friend said to me next that really caught me off guard. He said, Shanks, can't make sense of any of this. Where's your God in all of it? Where is your God? And admittedly, in times like this, nobody ever says, hey, Jason, where is your Satan in all of this? They always just kind of head straight to God, you know what I mean? <laughs> But it hurt. Where is God in all of this? Maybe you've asked that question before. Or somebody's asked that to you. And the reality is I didn't know what to say to my friend in the moment. All I could really do was listen and eventually just say, hey, bud, stay where you're at. I'm coming to get you. We'll figure this thing out. It wasn't really the time for that bumper sticker theology moment. You know, well, just... Let go and let God. Doesn't really work in these moments, does it? It's real. It's raw. And listen, when defining moments occur in life, and they do, there's a ton of well-meaning, hardworking, wonderful people who lack the proper foundation, plans, and the standards to withstand the storms of life. And therefore, they don't have what's necessary to pick up the pieces and move on. In fact, what all too often happens is they just end up getting stuck in a cycle of doing it over and over again in their life. And maybe you know people like that. And when you're stuck in that cycle, you, you get angry, you get confused. In fact, worse yet, a lot of people end up getting cynical and bitter. If you've ever met somebody before, you know, their life seems defined by one failure after another, unresolved issues. They don't deal with it. It's just a, a trail littered with debris and destruction behind them. You get to know this person, 
all too often, the older you get, the angrier and more bitter they seem. You know what I mean? In fact, they can just be really hard to do life with eventually. Maybe you know somebody like that in your life. Fact is this. Every single one of you out there, whether you think so or not, are building a spiritual house. And we need to be aware of that. We have to ask ourselves the questions in the next few weeks. What foundation am I building that house on? What plan am I following? What materials am I using? And what standards do I measure it by? Lose any one of those, and your house may not withstand the storms of life, and your structure may come crumbling down. So what we're going to end up talking about for the next few weeks is what you build your house on matters. And your house is your life, and so what you build your life on matters. Because when things like this happen, when these moments, these storms, these crucial times, when they occur in our lives, like Pastor Ben said, it's going to happen. It rained on both houses. We then have to decide what posture am I going to step into during this time. And there's at least four today I want to talk about. As we build our case week by week here, the, what you build your house on matters. But step one is, what posture will I take when the storms come and life is difficult and things get hard? If you have your worship guide, these, we're going to use a diagram today. If you want to follow along, you can on that. That's what it's there for. The first posture we have to deal with when the storms of life come, when we get these defining moments, is we have to ask ourselves, is this happening to me or is it happening to us? Because what does it mean when we take a posture that, that life is happening to us? And unfortunately, what it means is this. There's a very good chance you have a victim mentality or a victim mindset. When we have that, we, we just sort of believe that everything's happening to me. I don't ask for it. I don't deserve it. But as a result, we end up blaming everyone and everything around us for our problems in life. And the danger of this, if we're not careful, is we can fall into a chasm of self-pity and, again, bitterness. We're just constantly a victim. And I appreciated what this author had to say. His name is uh, Morty Lefko. He said this, he said, the primary source of feeling like a victim is the feeling of powerlessness. And because we don't like feeling that we are powerless, we tend to blame someone or something for causing that feeling. So we feel that we are a victim of circumstances or other people's actions and that we can't do anything about it. Things a victim might say is, I never get what I want. People can't be trusted. Just bad stuff always seems to find me. And if you feel powerless, then you're likely to go through life just kind of feeling life's just doing it to you. You know what I mean? I don't know how else to say it. You just, life is just constantly beating you up. And we're going to discuss this more in the coming weeks, but I want to go ahead and plant this seed and this groundwork because it's so critical. Followers of Jesus Christ are not victims they are overcomers through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. We do not live our life as victims. We walk in the promises of God. The next posture we have to wrestle with when these things happen is to ask yourself, is life happening for us? Now, this is an interesting one because if you're living your life with a posture of for us, essentially what slips in is a consumer mentality. We tend to ask, what's in it for me? And in these circumstances, let's face it, if we have that posture, it leads to selfishness. Things revolve around me, my world. In fact, really, people and things in my life are simply pawns for me to move around for my success and for my bidding. We see other people 
as just pawns that we use to get what we want out of life. And the truth is, what this eventually leads to, and and what so many people get caught in the trap of, is the happiness quest. We live life just chasing pleasure. And there's an inevitable problem when we live our life that way, when we say that life just exists to make me happy. And the truth is, when I'm not feeling happy, I'll just shop around until I can find happiness somewhere else. That might include my marriage. Stomp on any toes yet? We chase happiness like a drug, looking for our next fix. It's an addiction like any other. And it's a trap that too many Americans fall into. And listen, happiness itself is not a problem, but I will tell you this. Happiness without joy is not biblical. You have to have both. And the problem is this. When we have this for us posture and things truly get tough, what all too often happens to people is they just run. You know what? I'm not feeling happy anymore. I'm not getting any pleasure in this. I'm just going to take my business somewhere else. I'm just going to go somewhere else. I'm just going to run and start over so that I can feel happy there. But this is the trap that we talked about with my friend's marriage and so many other marriages. When you don't resolve the problems, when you don't deal with the pain, when you take the baggage and you just run, guess what? You're just taking taking it with you. It's just going to somewhere else. And eventually, you're just going to run into the same problems, the same issues, the same trouble that you had somewhere else. And guess what you do after that? Well, you quit and you go try it somewhere else. Anyone here seeing a dangerous cycle you could get caught in? At some point, you got to deal with the junk. But all too often, because we're just on this, this pleasure cruise, this journey for happiness, instead of having eyes on God, we keep all the focus on ourselves and we see that life exists for me. It's a trap. The next one's more subtle. In life, we can go through the journey just thinking things are happening around us. What does that mean, Jason? What are you talking about when you say around us? To say that life is happening around us means that we're just a spectator. We're just an observer. We're not really in the game. You know what I mean? Did you know you can be in this room and not be present? It's a big difference. It's a bit like when I go to the mall with my family. The girls are hopping from store to store. Where's Jason? He's on the couch. (laughs) He's drinking something yummy, watching people. And yes, that candle will smell great in our bathroom, and you look wonderful in those earrings. But am I in the game? Oh, heavens no. (laughs) I'm on the couch. And by the way, this just being a spectator, an observer, this was the sin of Adam in the garden It's passivity. It's doing nothing. See, at no time did Adam step up and say, Serpent, get out of here and protect Eve. He let her fall into the trap. He did nothing. And passivity, hear me on this, is a sin. It's subtle, but it's sin. Knowing something about someone, and I'm not talking about getting into everybody's business here. Don't walk up to a stranger and get, I mean, what I'm talking about is the people who are in your sphere of influence, your family members, your friends. When you know that they're walking down a dangerous road, when you know they're doing something that's not only hurting them, but hurting the people around them, and you do nothing about it, that's passivity. It's a sin. There's another word for it too. The legal term is negligence. You knowingly know that you need to address this and you don't do anything about it. And this can come from at least three different places, probably many more, but the first one is you're just being lazy 
And I think that there's a lot of particularly men out there, and I'm calling the men out on this one, who are being passive to things going on in their families and their marriage and the world around them. And it's laziness and it's a sin. Get in the game. Number two, we are scared to confront. A little bit of fight or flight may be built into this as well. Might get hurt if I confront. Might hurt their feelings. The third one can go with victim mentality sometimes, is that we might just have a sense of hopelessness because nothing you really do matters anyways. And I'm not going to make a difference. All three are wrong. We're not allowed to be lazy, and there are times you need to confront. In fact, will you please just hear me on this? Everybody hear me? There is a peace that only comes on the other side of a battlefield. And that includes relationships and family and confronting Sometimes you got to fight. And we don't like that. But ignoring problems and hoping they just magically disappear doesn't work. Have any of y'all figured that out in life? Just pretending that if I sweep this thing under the rug and it's not there, that it's going to magically disappear. But it doesn't. Those things we want to ignore, those things we try to hide, it's like a water stain on your, on your ceiling. You know, you decide, I'm, I'm just going to paint over it and pretend like it's not there. How many of you know that, that water stain's coming back if you don't go in and figure out what caused it? We're not allowed to ignore things and hope they go away. And the fourth posture is the one that I hope we do engage the fourth one is to say that when bad things happen, we need people to do life with us. We're going to need a community of people around us that you are not meant to do life alone. It's one of the greatest lies of our enemy to get you separated from the pack, to whisper in your ear, to isolate you and to tell you they don't care. Don't bother them with your stuff. It's a lie. And we've talked about this before. The enemy likes to do this. If you've seen National Geographic enough times, you know that wildebeest that gets disconnected from the pack, that falls behind, that is alone and isolated, it's the lion's dinner. Every time. If the enemy can get you isolated, whisper in your ear and tell you they don't care, he's got you right where he wants you. But to do life with us is to know that you're part of something bigger, that there's a group of uh, family and people around you who are ready to walk this journey with you, who are whispering life into your ears and telling you, to look towards Jesus, to trust in him during these times. And what I'm trying to say is that our lives are always best lived out in partnership with others. That's why Paul would tell the church in Philippi, he would say, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from this day until now. And because we're walking alongside others and because they're speaking life into us and truth into us, then we begin to realize when we're doing life with us that we're part of a bigger story and that God can use any circumstance in our life, even the circumstances we don't like, He can use these to mold us and make us into Jesus' image. God can redeem any terrible thing. And that we're called to something bigger in our lives than just living only for ourselves. We're called to step out in faith and trust God and his provision no matter the season. Even in the midst of the worst circumstances, the Bible says you can have joy. You can have joy and sorrow. 
And you will need that joy during those times. And you will need that group of people to remind you of joy, to walk alongside you, for you to be able to hold on to, for you to be able to, to support yourself with so that you don't walk alone. And I realize you don't always like the circumstances you experience. But you have to understand that God often uses those circumstances to get your attention and help you to change. Didn't say he brought the circumstances. We have an enemy for that. But he can take any circumstance and use it for his glory. And so this is the journey I'm inviting you into for the next few weeks. To walk with us. To grow. We've got so much more to talk about. And as I start to land the plane, I realize it's Inevitably, you might ask the question, well, what, what happened to your friend? <laughs> well, come back in the coming weeks and you'll find out. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about him. It's an amazing story. For today, though, I leave you with this from Proverbs 24. By wisdom, a house is built, and through understanding, it is established. And through knowledge, its rooms are filled. Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. For today, what I need you to wrestle with is when these storms of life come, will you choose to be a victim, live selfishly, Ignore it, pretend it didn't happen? Or will you choose to step into it, to ask God how he can use this to mold and make you into his image and find a group of people to walk alongside you so that they can support you, hold you accountable, and love you? Because what we will discover in the coming weeks that what you build your house on does matter because the storms are coming. And the real question that we have to wrestle with is, when the rain comes and the storms rise up, will you have a house that can stand, withstand the storm? Or will it be washed away? Let's pray. <clears throat>